He did 16. One six. One six C on church membership. Okay, if you go to davepawson.org, you can look for church membership. He did 16 talks on church membership. Okay, uh, so I've just extracted about uh, 10 minutes, I think, of one session on fellowship. Okay, I'll share with you, uh, you know, for today's devotion, just to lay the work. Uh, okay, so this is just one very small part of what he shared. Okay. Let me just read you three verses from Romans 15. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another therefore as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Let us pray. Father burn these words into our hearts. Help us to welcome one another as you have welcomed us, for Christ's sake. Amen. I remember one day I went to a prayer meeting in Bahrain in the Persian Gulf and I left my shoes at the door because those inside were Indian Christians and this was their custom and reverence. And so in stocking feet I went in and to my surprise we didn't sit for prayer, we didn't stand for prayer, we didn't kneel for prayer. We lay down on the floor and we put our foreheads on the carpet and we prostrated ourselves before God in prayer. It was beautiful. I remember some years earlier in a little stone chapel right on the shore of the Shetland Islands so close to the sea that the waves were actually washing the church windows and running up the chapel wall with some great big burly fishermen led by one of the biggest men with one of the biggest faiths and one of the biggest hearts I've ever met, Dordie Pottinger, with navy blue polo neck fisherman's jerseys and a profound odor of fish in the little chapel. And we prayed like little children. And it was the same thing as in the Persian Gulf, exactly. I remember meetings some Indians from Ecuador, Indians of whom you've heard and read, whose very teeth have been shaped to eat human flesh. And I remember shaking hands with them, looking into their faces, singing with them. And it was the same thing as in the Persian Gulf and in Shetland. And some of you will remember with me the trip we had behind the Iron Curtain last spring and how in those churches up in the part of Czechoslovakia nearest the Polish border we just felt one with people whose language we didn't know who kissed us on both cheeks as they left all of them so that we were rubbed red raw on our cheeks like sandpaper and it was the same thing as with the Agar Indians and with the Indians in the Persian Gulf and with the Shetland fisher folk what was it it was fellowship. And of all the blessings that have come into my life since I knew Jesus Christ, I would put this one way up near the top. The joy of Christian fellowship is something that you can find nowhere else. Now what is it? It is in fact enjoying each other's company at the very simplest. But it's more than that. It is enjoying the company of Christ together. And Christian fellowship is the very deepest relationship there can ever be on earth between two people. Now I know that marriage is a very close relationship. And when that marriage goes with Christian fellowship, that really is deep. But between people who otherwise have nothing in common, the closest relationship that there can be on earth is Christian fellowship. And it's the sweetest thing. The world is crying out for relationships. Most of the songs that are being judged for the song for Europe are crying out for relationship. Some of them are hopeful and optimistic, wanting someone to love and someone to be loved and hoping that round the corner there's someone coming. But some of them are pessimistic and talk of a love that's been lost. And people know 
that life consists in your relationships with others. And Christian fellowship meets that need in a way that nothing else can. And as cities get bigger and bigger and people get lost in the crowd, and as we have to mix with more and more people every day with whom we cannot have relationships because we'll only see them once and then they're gone. It becomes more and more lonely. The big city is the loneliest place on earth. Once upon a time you lived in a little village, you knew everybody from the postman to the farmer down the road. Everybody. Now, well, you get on a tube train and you look at those miserable faces and you think, I'll never see you again. We're just stuck together for five minutes and then gone. It's a lonely world in which we live and it's crying out for this thing called fellowship. Now that I'm a number on a data card in a computer, I want to be a person and I want to know people. Now the church is not only for worship, for God to enjoy, it is for fellowship, for people to enjoy. And we're not just here to have worship, we're here to have fellowship. And I want to speak very practically tonight about how we get that, how we spoil it. Because it's one of the greatest gifts that God can give us and it's one of the easiest things to throw away. Now what is Christian fellowship? I find it difficult to describe, it's much more difficult to experience. When I fell in love with my wife and somebody had said to me, well what's it like? I wouldn't have been able to describe it. I wouldn't be able to say what made me do such mad things and sent me out walking miles just to have a little time with her. I don't know what got over me, what came over me, and I still don't. You can't put into words the deepest relationships of life. You can't just define Christian fellowship. You know that it jumps all ages. That a young Christian in the teens and a saint in his eighties can have Christian fellowship. Jumps all ages. There's no generation gap in real fellowship. It jumps both, and se both sexes because in Christ there is neither male nor female. It jumps over all languages. And I've found that I can have Christian fellowship with a man whose language I don't understand and he can have fellowship with me. It jumps over all race and colour. Christian fellowship is colour blind. And it has no regard for that. It jumps over all class distinctions, all political outlooks, all cultures. It jumps over iron and bamboo curtains. There is no limit whatever to Christian fellowship except that it is limited to those in Christ. But it has no other limit that I know. It even jumps over the barrier of death because the fellowship I have with people here I know cannot be destroyed beyond the grave. Just can't. Those who are in Christ are in Christ forever and therefore they are in a fellowship that can't be touched. My father rang me up a few days ago and he said, what shall I put on mother's gravestone? He said, I want something quite simple, something that will express Christian hope, something that will mean something to our family. What shall I put on? And my mind went back to the days when we were little children. We used to go away from home on holiday and used to come back or if we'd been staying away with relatives or friends. When we came in the front door, there was always a piece of paper pinned up in the hall and it said, welcome home on it. Little drawing or maybe a little flower or something, some little picture. There was always a welcome home. So I said to my father, why don't you put on the gravestone, welcome home. So he's going to do that. You see, only a Christian could say that. Only those who are in Christ can say that. Because it is home. It's a fellowship that goes on and on. Leaps over all barriers, except the barrier of sin. By contrast, human fellowship does not last beyond death. And human fellowship always imposes some other limit, a limit of temperament, a limit of interest, a limit of activity. Always there is some limit beyond which the fellowship cannot extend. There are profound political brotherhoods. But when I've been to the House of Commons Christian Fellowship, I've found liberals and conservatives and socialists meeting down together. There are other brotherhoods and other fellowships that are built up on common interests in the present, common interest in sport, in family life or whatever. But there is only one relationship between people that jumps over all these 
and establishes a relationship forever. Now what is its basis? Originally the phrase means to be partners, to share in something, to have something in common when you meet. Now of course this helps human friendship. You meet somebody for the first time and you begin to talk and then you say, oh, do you come from there? Why, I come from there too. And something in common starts off a relationship. But when two Christians meet, they may never have met before. They may come from different places. They may have had nothing in common at the human level. And they discover within five minutes that they're talking as if they'd known each other all their lives. Have you had this experience? And you'll get this funny feeling, have we met before? And in many cases, no, we never did. What is it that Christians have in common that gives them this fellowship with one another? Here are five things. First, when one Christian meets another, he's meeting someone who has the same father. Now, God is not the father of all men. That's not a Bible teaching. It's a common humanist a sort of Christian humanist belief, it's a common religious idea that the brotherhood of man is based on the fatherhood of God. But you know the word brethren in scripture means something much less than the human race. The word brother as it is used in the Bible means this, that when two Christians meet, they're meeting a long lost member of their own family. When I meet another Christian, this is my brother, this is my sister. We've been born twice, both of us. The first time we were born of different parents. The second time we were born of the same father. That makes us one family. And we both talk to the same dad in our prayers. The second thing we have is that we both have the same savior. And when you meet someone, you know Jesus, I know Jesus too. It's a help in ordinary friendship if you know someone in common, but when you can say, oh, we both know the most wonderful friend, that really is fellowship. And just to say to someone, you know Jesus too. He saved you too. He saved me. Same person. So we have him in common. But there's more than that. It's something even deeper. The third thing that two Christians have in common before they ever meet is that they have the same spirit in their hearts. So that if I meet another Christian, the spirit in my heart and the spirit in his heart is the same. Not two different spirits, one Holy Spirit. And it's amazing how the experience of meeting someone and even before talking the spirit says, I'm in him too. If you had that experience, I'm sure you have. I went into a restaurant in the high street and a good lady came and took my order and brought me the soup and I began to wonder. She didn't say anything, she just gave me the soup. When she brought me the main course, I, I asked her if she was a Christian and she was. Remember sitting in a law court and watching the face of the foreman of the jury and thinking, the Holy Spirit's in you too. And I met him in the corridor outside afterwards and said, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? Are you a Christian? He said, yes. Are you? This is fellowship. You can't create it, you can't manufacture it, it's there or it isn't. But when it's there, it's a lovely thing. Now, I, I'm not stopping there. What else have we in common? I'll tell you a fourth thing that we have in common. We've got the same book. And wherever you go in the world, you'll find Christians only read one book. It might be in a different language, it might be in a different co cover, might not be in black leather, Billy Graham's are always in red. He says Christians should always have red Bibles for an obvious reason. But it doesn't matter what the pages are like, whether they're gold-edged or whether it's in your paper or in a paperback. Christians have the same book and they can talk to each other because they have the same basic language. They have the same basic thought forms and the fellowship is there. And fourthly, Christians have the same future. They're all going to the same place. And it's wonderful to go on a journey and meet someone who's going to the same destination and to share the journey with them. I'll tell you the most wonderful example of that I've come across. It's a personal illustration. But my grandfather was a preacher and halfway through his ministry he developed tuberculosis of the throat and the doctor said you can never preach again. You mustn't even speak again. And he had to communicate with my father and his sister and brothers by writing little notes on scraps of paper. 
and I've seen those little scraps of paper. Good night. And the doctor said, there's only one hope for his recovery. He'll never preach again, but if you could get him to Switzerland, to a clinic at Davos Platz, then he might get better. Well, they saved up, they planned, they did everything they could, they scraped, and they managed to get together enough fare for one ticket to Davos Platz. And they set off, and they took him to Victoria Station to get the boat train. And they wondered how on earth he'd managed going through customs and on the boat, not knowing French or German and not being able to do anything other than scribble a little English. How would he manage? This was in the days before common markets and, and when you could find people speaking English at every street corner on the continent. So they prayed and asked the Lord and they put him in a railway compartment. There was one other man in the compartment and my father turned to him and said, I wonder if you could see my father onto the boat. And he can't talk, so could you just help him through customs and so on? And the man said, well, Where's he going to? Father said, Davos Platz. The man said, why, I'm going there too. And they just set off together. Isn't it lovely to go somewhere together, to know that you can travel together, that you can help each other on the way. When you meet somebody who's going to heaven, you can say, isn't that great? That's exactly where I'm going. We can help each other on the road. We've got the same destiny, the same future. We can walk together and love each other on the way. That's fellowship. The same Father, the same Saviour, the same Spirit, the same book, the same destiny. And if you meet somebody with those five things in common with you, you can have fellowship with them straight away. I hope that uh, that short segment <coughs> helps us to have a good understanding of uh, Christian fellowship and the whole area of church membership. So church membership is much more than just coming for worship, but it's the fellowship that's important uh, even for church membership. Okay, uh, so we just discussed about this whole area, his, his five points I, I think very helpful. All of us who are Christians, we have the same Father, we have the same Saviour, Jesus Christ, with the same Holy Spirit, we have the same book that we read from, the Bible, and we are all going to the same destination and even death will not separate us because there is life after death so I, those, I, I felt that those are good talking points when we talk about fellowship